Hi everyone, thanks for listening to another episode of Dogman Encounters Radio. I'm Vic Cundiff and I'll be your host for the show. If you've had a Dogman Encounter of your own and would like to speak with me, whether in private or on the show, please go to dogmanencounters.com and submit a report. I'd love to hear from you. Tonight's guest is Buster. Buster, welcome to the show. Hey Vic, how are you? I'm doing good, and you? I'm doing well, thank you. Well, that's good to hear. Thanks for being here. Buster, please give us a brief bio on yourself. My name's Buster. I'm 35 years old. I grew up in Dallas, Texas. When I was 18, I moved to Denton to attend school at the University of North Texas. I currently live in Denton right now. I'm in the uh, car industry, have been for the past couple of years, and that's about it. Buster, how do you find out about me and what I do? Well, the reason I found out about you after the encounter that me and my brother and Danny had, I was really shaken up about it. Didn't know where to go. Didn't know where to turn to. It's not like you can just walk up to somebody in your family or walk up to one of your friends and say, hey, this is what I saw. So I turned to the uh, Internet and I just started researching what I saw I just happened to stumble upon your website, and after listening to all the people, their encounters, and everything like that, that's when I reached out to you and told my story to you, and everything that happened to me. Well, I'm so glad you found out about me. What did you think when you found out about all the other people who have seen dog men? Well, I was actually relieved. I mean, when something like that happens to you, You think you're the only person that has gone through something like that, going through uh, what I saw. I'm like, there's probably no one alive that's seen what I saw, that the experience I just had has happened to them. So after finding your website and listening to all those other people, all those other encounters, it was actually a big relief to know that I wasn't the only person out there and that there was other people out there that's had the same encounter as me. And while I was listening to it, I was thinking maybe if there's some way I can reach out to them, I probably spent four or five hours just on your website, just listening to all the people's encounters, all their stories and everything like that. Well, I'm so glad you found out about the show and all those other eyewitnesses who went through the same thing that you did. Last weekend, you told some good friends about the encounter you had. How'd they respond when you told them? Well, when I told Todd and Mark about it, the reason I told Todd about it, one thing about me and my brother, I mean, as far as it goes about Bigfoot and Dogman and stuff like that, our whole life we thought it was silly and kind of dumb that somebody would believe in that. And it had been about two years ago, Todd had told us an encounter he had, I think he was like 13 or 14 at the time, he was hunting with his buddies or something like that back in West Texas, and he said he saw a Bigfoot. And I just remember me and my brother did the best we could just to, and I feel bad saying this now, but we just did the best we could to make him feel like a fool and that somebody that believed in Bigfoot was dumb. There was no possible way Bigfoot was real. So the reason we told him is because after our experience, we kind of felt bad about what we did and we felt that we owed him an apology. And that's the reason why we told him. And while we was telling Todd, it was funny. Well, it wasn't funny, but the whole time we was telling him, it's not like he was laughing or grinning or anything like that. It's like he was waiting for us to stop talking because he had a story to tell about something that happened or a story or an encounter he heard when he was a kid. Well, I know you had to feel a lot better when you shared your experience with him. Absolutely. Yeah, it's funny how things work like that. From what I understand, your encounter has spurred quite a bit of curiosity and dogmen on your part. Please expand upon that for us. You know, granted, my whole life was told by my parents, just how every parent tells their kids growing up, things like that don't exist. There's nothing to be afraid of in the dark. There's nothing in the woods that can hurt you. And uh, obviously, I grew up my whole life believing that. So as soon as I had my encounter, Vic, I was petrified. I mean, I didn't think it was some type of creature that has evolved into what it was. Personally, I thought it was some kind of demon from hell. Uh, I didn't think that something like that could exist. I always thought, you know, same thing with Bigfoot. I always thought, okay, if these things are real, 
there has to be some kind of record of them. There has to be some kind of bones that people find or something like that. And it's never came up. So the thought of that was just stuff like that doesn't exist. So as soon as I saw it, I'm like, well, the only rational thing it could be is something from hell, a demon. But after going on your website and listening to other people's encounters and talking with you, I guess my curiosity has gotten to like, well, you know what? This probably isn't a demon. I mean, the story that you told me about people's encounters when they saw them, when they were eating something or when they were drinking water or something like that. And I guess that made me think, well, demons probably don't need to eat or drink water or something like that. So I guess this is something that really does roam the woods. So I guess the fear of what I had was just of the not knowing and something that I've never seen before. So the only thing in my mind and my brain at the time was, hey, this is a demon. But actually, after talking to you, hearing people's stories, the curiosity, it just got to where I'm like, okay, I think this is something that actually roams through the woods. And it's just a curiosity of now I want to know what it is. Are you surprised to be so interested in learning about them, considering how badly shaken you were and still are because of that experience? I'm actually very surprised. You know, I mean, before this encounter happened, there was those Bigfoot movies that would come on TV and just out of curiosity, I would watch them. You know, it was entertaining, but I never gave it any more thought than that. Like I was saying, I thought it was something that was fake. People were just telling stories or something like that. So being involved in it and actually wanting to know and actually wanting to go out in the woods and talking with other people and hearing other people's encounters and trying to figure out exactly what this thing is, yeah, it's very surprising to me. Yeah, at first glance, I guess it wouldn't make sense that you would be so interested in something that terrified you so badly, but as time goes by and you have more time to think about it, it does make a lot of sense. It'd be that way. It is all about exposure. You're not going to get that much better if you don't expose yourself to this whole phenomenon, and I'm glad to see you doing that. Before we get into the details of your encounter, Buster, please tell us about the place where it happened. All right, well, where this took place at, Vic, it's in Texas. It's in Grayson County. It was on Lake Texoma. Half of Lake Texoma is on the Texas side. Half of the lake is on Oklahoma. That's where you get the name Lake Texoma. And so for the past three, four years, my brother Bubba and his wife, they owned a couple slips there at the lake and they have a lake house down there. One thing I like about the lake, the surrounding area around it, a lot of it's owned by the Corps of Engineers, so people can go out there and hunt, and there's lots of deer out there, there's lots of pigs out there. Hunting's really good. People probably drive hours to a striper fish. The fishing out there is really good as well. It sounds like an amazing area. It's a shame that you had to have that experience in a place like that, and now you're so gun-shy about going back there. Yeah, it's a really beautiful place. Like I was saying, the uh, scenery around there is real nice. I never even in my wildest dreams would have thought that there was something out there in the woods like what we saw. Well, you're not alone. Most people who run into these things never had a clue that they'd run into one. So that doesn't make you any different than most people. All right, Buster, please tell us about your encounter. Give us every last detail that comes to mind. All right, well... Me and my family got there Friday night. We was all at the boat slip. And the one thing about these boat slips, it's not just like regular boat slips where you park your boat and everything like that. The thing about these boat slips, a lot of people, you know, they hang out and everything like that because these boat slips, once you park your boat, there's this area. It's like an 18 by 18, 20 by 20 or something like that. And these people are the owners of these boat slips. I say a boat slip, but it's more like an outdoor patio. People put furniture out there there's cabinets out there there's grills and everything like that so people can just pretty much hang out there all day so we were out there and we were talking about going jugging it's something that we've done in the past cool thing about jugging it's just a real fast and easy efficient way to catch catfish and basically what jugging is for those people that don't know you get a milk jug or an empty bleach bottle or something like that with like a 20, 30-foot fishing line on it with a weight on the bottom. And basically, just go out in the middle of the lake, set the hooks with shad or whatever bait you want to put forth to have and throw it out there. And you leave it out there for four or five hours, and you come back, and usually there's lots of fish on there. 
we've done that before, and, you know, we've caught 30, 40, 50 pound catfish. Well, we was getting everything ready, and I was telling Bubba, I'm like, why don't we try setting limb lines this time? And the reason we haven't done that before in the past is because the boat that my brother has, it's a big boat. And the place where we wanted to set the limb lines, it was in the river. And the thing about his boat, we couldn't put it out there because it would probably get stuck. There's lots of shallow parts and everything like that. Well, we had a deer lease, and the deer lease that we had, we had a, I don't know, it was like a, probably a 13, 14-foot John boat. And we had it out there because there was a probably about a five, six-acre lake that we would duck hunt. And there was a place we had to go on that lake that had a duck blind. And the only, only way we could get there was with the John boat. So we got off that deer lease this year. So my brother had to put the John boat at the lake. So as we're doing the jug lines and everything like that, I'm like, hey, Bubba, we got this John boat. Why don't we try setting some limb lines out? He's like, yeah, that's cool. That sounds like fun. So that was Friday night. So the next day, uh, Saturday, we go out. Kids are fishing. We're hanging out at the lake basically what we always do then we decided to go set the jugs out we set the jugs out we probably set 10 11 12 something like that and then we go and we head to the red river now while we're going in the red river it's our first time there we all thought it looked pretty cool because there was all these oak trees and all these tree branches and everything like that and they're just going over the river which we thought was pretty nice because at the time it was probably 97 um, probably a 100 degrees or something like that and it was real hot and the trees that was going over the river it made a nice shade for us well first let me back up a little bit we knew that we were going to be setting the jugs at night so when we set these jug lines we got this reflective tape and we wrapped it all around the jugs that way at night while we were going we would shine the spotlight and we would see the uh, reflection from the jug and it'd be easier for us to see so while we're getting to the river, we say, you know, it would probably make sense because we're probably going to be coming here at night. So instead of getting a spotlight and shining to the left and shining to the right, let's just put all the limb lines on one side. And basically what limb lines is, so you have these small branches going over the river, right? So it's basically just getting a string, tying a hook on it, and it dangles in the water four or five feet. And when a big fish gets on it or something like that, that limb acts like a fishing pole. So when it goes down on it, that limb line goes up and it sets the hook. We come back in a couple hours, boom, we got a fish. So we decided to put it on the right side of the deal. That way, while we're shining the spotlight, we didn't have to go back to the left and right. We could just shine it on the right side of the bank. It'd be easier for us to find. So after we set those, we also put reflective tape around the branches. So we did that. We put about 10 out. That took us a little while. We hung out, did some other stuff. We trolled, tried to catch some sand bass, everything like that. Didn't have much luck. Then we went back to the dock, ate dinner, hung out. The kids did some more fishing, swimming, all that good stuff. So it was probably about 9.45, 10, I want to say. All the kids went to bed. The jokes have been out there for a while. Let's go check them. The limb line's been out there for a while. Let's go see what we got. Let me back up because I just remember something else. So... We weren't at my brother's big boat. We were in his John boat, which is, like I said, it's a 12, 14, 15 foot or something like that. And it has a 25 horsepower pull start. It's like either a Johnson or an Everhart. And while he was starting it, while we were leaving the deal, it took him about 20, 30 pulls. I didn't think we were going to get it started because we had had it at the deer lease for all these years. And we didn't use it that much. And it got rained on in the weather and everything like that. I thought the gas lines maybe have dumped up. I thought it didn't work. But finally, after about 25, 30 pulls, something like that, he finally got it started. And I mean, one time I got upset with him, with Bubba, because while we were setting the jug lines, well, I didn't get upset with him. I guess I got upset with the situation because the jug line was going back towards the engine, towards the propeller, and it was going to get stuck. So he had to shut the motor off or the strain from the jug line would get all tangled up. And then again, it probably took us another 25, 30 pulls to get it started. So that was kind of important because what's going to happen later. I just thought I would tell you that. So anyway, it's probably about 9.45, 10 o'clock. It might be a little bit later. I don't know. We go out, we check the jug. I think we caught one that was decent size. We caught some other small ones, nothing to really brag about. There was probably a couple that was pretty good. And then we start heading towards the river. So 
again, we're going the Red River. We have the spotlight shining. We have that full tape, which when we shine it, it makes it really, really easy to see because it reflects back and everything like that. That's the reason why we did it. So <clears throat> we're showing on the right side. We'd probably go about four or five limb lines. And I don't think we caught anything. Well, we get to like the fifth or the sixth one, and we start hearing like some commotion or something pushing the trees or something like that. And what's going through my mind, you know, like I was saying earlier, that there's tons of deer out there, tons of hogs, turkeys, and everything like that. And usually around this time of year in Texas, it may be in the month or two, it may have been last month, but all I know it's in the summer. These white-tailed deer, they have these velvet on their antlers, and what they'll do, they'll go up to these trees, and they'll just like, you know, just scratch their velvet up and down to try to get that velvet off. And that's what was going through my mind. I thought it was either some kind of deer, some kind of pig, or something like that, because you could almost hear like a low, low growl, like a low snort, and just like trees going and everything like that. Well, <clears throat> as soon as we hear that, my brother shoved off the engine. I don't know why he did that, but we're on the right side of the bank, and we're probably about, I'm trying, we're probably about, I don't know, 25, 30 yards from where we're hearing the sound. And we're just, we stayed there for about 10, 15 seconds just so we could hear what was going on and everything like that. And like I said, my brother had the engine off. So then all of a sudden there's a big branch that's overhanging us. So Bubba, he gets this branch and he starts kind of like just getting his arms and kind of pushing us so we can get some momentum so we can go on to the left side of the bank. <clears throat> so what we wanted to do, we wanted to get to, get to the left side of the bank, hang on to a tree over there. So Danny could shine his light and see just what this thing was. You know, we thought, uh, like I was saying, we thought it was a pig or something like that. So while we're about half, and so while we're, we're we're drifting back to the left side of the bank, we're probably halfway through, and then all of a sudden we hear a crash and something, something just tossed at us. I don't know if it was tossed. I don't know if it was rolled or dropped, but it was. It wasn't. You know, it, something hit the. It, it came close to hitting the right side of our boat. And it just made a, a huge splash. We all three almost fell out the boat. And this just wasn't a, a normal sized rock. It was like a, just, just picture like a, like an F 250 just barreling down the hill at like 60 miles an hour, jumping the bank, going up about 10 foot and just crashing down right next to our boat. That's, that's like, to me, that's what it, it sounded like. That's what the momentum had. Well, the force from it almost knocked us off the boat. So Danny, so Danny had the spotlight, right? And the spotlight was, it, it was a spotlight we used to have on our deer lease. It was the one that you just plug into the ashtray. But we, we knew that there wasn't in that little John boat we had, we knew that there wasn't, you know, a, a, a place to put like a cigar lighter or something like that. So we just kind of converted it to one that had the uh, clips on it so you could put on a battery terminal. So there was just these small clips on a battery terminal or post or whatever you want to call them. Well, when that rock or tree or freaking truck or whatever the heck it was <clears throat> went down and almost knocked us off, I think Danny got, D Danny got off balance or something like that, and it ripped the clips off the post. So at this point, we weren't seeing anything. Well, about this time, and just the force from it just like made us just like sail towards the left side of the bank. All right. So once we got on the left side of the bank, my brother kind of gets the deal, and he's kind of you know securing us. And that's when we see it. We see we, me and my brother, me and brother, we both look at where the sign was coming from, and it was on all fours, and it was walking probably like ten, twelve foot, something like that. And I just remember it was, it wasn't, a, as soon as I saw it, I'm like, okay, this isn't a dog. This isn't a mountain lion. This has to be, if it's a, it probably has to be like a 15 and 2,000 pound pig or something like that. That was the only thing going from my mind. How how far it was up, like picture just, okay, picture like a grown man getting on all fours and then just like another grown man getting on him. That's how high, uh, he was on all fours, but that's how tall it was, whatever that is. Five foot, five and a half, six foot, something like that. <clears throat> and I just remember it just kept walking back and forth. And the only thing I was thinking in my mind is like a, like a tiger or a lion just like locked up, you know, like when you see them at the zoo. And they're just like walking back and forth. And they're just like uh, looking at you, just like uh, pacing the cage. That's what this thing was doing, man. 
just walking back and forth. Ten, but like I said, it was going like 10, 12 foot one way. And it was dark, but I couldn't see it. But in my mind, it was like he didn't take his head off of us. He didn't take his eyes off of us. It, it, like he kept his head and his eyes on us the whole time. And as he would turn, his body would turn, but his head and his eyes would look would stay exactly on us and he would just walk back and forth and stuff like that. Like, like he was trying to figure out what he was going to do or, or, or how he was going to kill us or something like that. Well, <clears throat> okay. So early in the day, uh, Danny, I remember he had this cigarette lighter and he was getting mad because it got wet or something like that. And he was trying to light a cigarette and it took him like seven or eight times to light it or something like that. So me and Bubba, we're looking at this thing and, we're not looking at each other. We're not seeing anything. I couldn't breathe. It was one of those feelings you're like, this is something that probably no other human being has ever seen before in their in their life. I'm probably the only person that, that has seen something like this before. So while we're doing that, Danny, uh, like I said, he had the spotlight and he was trying to I guess I really don't. I really don't know what he was doing, but he was trying to light where the bottom of the boat was, where the transom is, or something like that, where the battery was, so he could find out where, you know, the clips were on and everything like that on the battery, so he could find the spotlight and direction where where we was looking. So I just remember he, he was like cussing and talking loud and stuff like that, and, and and me and Bub was both so scared we couldn't talk, and I couldn't tell him to shut up or anything like that. I just because I just remember on the left side of the boat was my brother. I was in the middle. And Danny was about the motor. And I just remember I got my right hand and I just got down the shirt and kind of pulled it like I was telling him to be quiet or something like that. But it didn't do no good because he kept on going with what he was doing. Well, and this, so this probably took, I don't know, maybe 15, 20 seconds, this whole thing. And finally he gets, he gets it working and everything like that. And he's laughing and he's like, yeah, I got it. And we're like, and, and, we'll, and I'm pushing him again to be quiet and everything like that. And he looks at us, and he didn't even – we didn't even have to tell him where to sign the light because he knew where our eyes were exactly looking that something was out there. So he signed it on there, and, you know, through this whole experience that, you know, <clears throat> of what I'm about to tell you about how it was doing this and how it was doing that, the thing that freaked me out the most, the thing that I hear in my dreams, I hear in my nightmares, and I hear while um just, you know, awake is the sound it made. So uh, let's say you had three or four of those tractor tires lined up, okay? And then you got like this big knife and you laid these tires up, one right here, one right here, one right here, one right here, you know, left and right. And then you got this knife and you just stabbed it in that tire. It would probably make a sound, you know, like a big, long hissing sound like like that right well think of that sound all right so just picture you getting a knife and getting that tire and boom just just hitting that tire and so the air can come out and as soon as you hit that one you hit the other one then as soon as you hit the other one you hit the other one so there was a sound like i was saying just of just three or four five six seven eight like of this of like sound is being shot out of like a tank or a tire or something like that that so we started hearing so the whole time Danny had his light on it so we heard that and that's when he started getting up and then it was like bones just bones were just cracking like the only way I can describe it like you know those like those big tractors or I don't know they're not tractors but they're like that equipment that like uh road construction crews like when the uh, concrete's wet they have like that, that big rolly thing and they just roll it along like the wet concrete. Just like picture, there's all these bags of just bags of like thousands of bones, and this huge heavy machinery is just going over it. And all you can hear is just crack, crack, crack. That's what it sounded like. So it was just why he was standing up. Why he was standing up? The first thing you heard was all these this this air going out, and then just bones cracking like it was robotic or. I, I don't know. I can't describe it. It was just the thought, and it was loud too. It was like tree branches were breaking, but it was. I mean, you you could tell it was coming from whatever that creature was. His bones were like sifting into place or something like that. So as soon as that happened, 
he had Danny had the light on the thing, and this thing had his okay. Like when people say it, it was twelve foot tall, I don't, I, I, I don't, I really don't know how they can tell that unless they go back the next day and there's some kind of point of you know a reference where they bring a tape measure or something like that. All I know, it was over ten foot tall. It had to have been. I mean, it could have been twelve, thirteen, fourteen foot tall. It was, it was massive. So. Danny shines the light on, and the first thing you see is like these yellow, orange eyes. But at this point, he's not looking at it. He has his head up in the air, like to the right, and it's like he's like snapping at something. Like just picture, like uh, just picture, like if a, if a bee was going by him or something like that, and he was trying to catch it in his teeth. That's that's exactly what he was doing, and you could hear just crash, crash of his teeth, just crashing. And <clears throat> I remember he had these big, broad shoulders. And he was like panting, just like panting, like just, just like not panting, but like breathing. His chest would go up, and and his shoulders would rise up, and it would go back down. And then you could, and then you could see it again. His 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 shoulders would go up, and you know his 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 chest would go out, just taking deep breaths. And then he looked at us, and I still remember. Okay. Like, you know, like when a dog gets done eating or something like that, and there's like food on the side of, of their teeth, and I don't know what they call it, uh, licking their chops or something like that. But it's like he looked at us, and he was still breathing. And, and if I could just go back to the breathing, too, you know, like when the only thing I can think of is breathing, like, like picture like these big giant, like six foot six they're all decked out they have muscles and everything like that like uh right before they go into like a cage fight of mma or something like that and they're trying to get themselves like pissed or pumped up just so they can just like just like beat whoever they're about to fight and and they're breathing and everything like that just walk around the cage like no one can stop them i don't know if that makes sense but that's kind of like how i, I like pictured this thing just like the breathing and everything so anyway He's looking at us. His teeth are, like I said, bite, trying to bite from he, just like in the air. And it was like, like, like had his nose up trying to smell something. I still remember what his, his, his ears were real pointed, pointed like a, his, his ears didn't look. My brother has a lab. He has a silver lab. His name's Bo. It, it wasn't, it wasn't a, it wasn't because those ears fall down. It wasn't a, it wasn't ears like that. These ears were like pointed straight up. And I can still remember <clears throat> on each ear, there was like two or three strands. For some reason, I still remember that there was two or three strands of like this off hair that was like going off his ears or something like that. But all right. So <clears throat> he looks at us and like I was saying, you know, like when dogs get done eating or something like that and they have food on the, le- on, you know, the left or right side of their, of their face or something like that. I, I think it's called licking their chops or something, but it's like he, he did that. His his top lip like snarled up, and then I actually just saw his. He had this long tongue like a dog, and it just licked the left side of his face, and it licked the right side of his face. And I remember he had hair all over his body. I, I, I don't know what color it was. I don't know if it was red. I don't know if it was dark brown. I'm assuming it was blackish. I still remember that he had like where his stomach was, it's like I could see like muscles, like a six pack and it was black. And, and his hands, they looked like human hands. I don't know what color his hands were or anything like that. Like I said, I was probably 30 yards away because that's how far the banks was. But I think since I got so, since we got so a a good picture of what it looked like and everything like that, and I can't say for sure, but I'm thinking what had happened after we saw it, I think my brother let go of it, and he can't remember because I asked him. But I think what had happened after he let go of that tree branch, I think we started floating closer towards where he was. Because like I said, when we had the spotlight, when Danny had that spotlight, we saw I saw every bit of it. So his hands, they looked like human hands. They weren't like a dog. They weren't paws or anything like that. They, had, they were human hands, and there was, I don't know how long they were, an inch and a half, two uh, I, I I don't know, but I, I could tell they were they were sharp, and he was just kind of like rocking back and forth, and he had his head going up and down, and he, he was just panting, and I could see his nose; he looked like a dog. His face his face looked kind of like a German Shepherd a little bit, 
his his snout didn't go out far. It wasn't far out like a like a crocodile or anything like that. But it didn't go in as much as a as a as a regular canine did, as a regular German Shepherd. It went out a little bit. So we're looking at it, and no one's really saying anything. And uh, the only thing I'm thinking of, I'm like, you know what? This is it. We're dead. This uh, it, it, just how massive this thing is. Just how pissed off this thing. I mean, it looked mad. Like it like it was mad. Uh, I don't know if we got into his space while he was eating or if we got close to his home, but it looked like he was mad. It's like he wanted just how this thing was. He could rip all of our, our arms off, our legs off, everything, and just like, like he wanted to just take us to hell with him and take our souls. That, that's kind of what I was thinking. I know that kind of seems out there, but when you see something like this, something that's not supposed to exist, that's what's going to go through your mind. So about this time, we, me and Danny here, Bubba trying to start the motor. And the only thing I'm thinking, I'm like, oh, crap. Because early in the day, like I said, it took them 25, 30 times to start it. And then while we was out jugging, when that line almost got caught up in the propeller, it probably took them another 25, 30 times to start it, too. And I'm like, there's, there's no way we're getting out of here. Well, by the grace of God or whoever, that second time Bubba lifts the uh, starts, the, you know, pulls on the motor, it starts. And I just remember Danny, he screamed as loud as he could, get us the hell out of here. So, and like I said, this is only a 20, this is 12, 13 foot John boat. It's a, it's a 20, 20, 25, I don't know exactly what it is, but it's a small 20, 25 horsepower Johnson Everett or something like that. So we start going and we start picking up some speed and everything like that. And then, so the next thing we know, and, and like I said, so we're going and he's on the left side right now because we was turning around the other way and we was on the right side, but now he's on the left side. And then all we could hear was just tree branches going like, like there was three or four big giant John Deere tractors, man, just in a row, just knocking trees down, just making a ruckus. That's all we could hear. So Bubba's going, but at the same time, <clears throat> I'm looking back because I don't know what's going on. And Danny has this spotlight and he's shining it in the air and he's trying to shine it on where all this commotion is going on and everything like that. And we see it. And, you know, I told you this before, but the thing that, the thing that creeped me out, well, one of the many things that creeped me out about this was just how fast this thing was. It was almost like it wasn't just like, you could see it like dark, like, 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 all right. So like pictures in the space, like in a, a certain spot, and then it would run and then you would, like shine the light, and you're like, I didn't even see it run. How the did it get there so fast? Like it was almost like fake or like cartoonish. So anyway, we're going, and the back of my mind, I'm thinking, all right, so where we are right now to where the main part of the big lake, the main part of Lake Tecoma is, that's probably a two and a half, three minute boat ride. And this little old boat, this little old motor we got. So we're going, Bubba. I don't even think he's looking back. He's just trying to get us the out of there. There was actually big. There was I didn't think about until we was talking about this today. I just now remember it today. We actually had like this big ice chest that we had like cokes in, and like um, <clears throat> and like some of the big uh, some of the fish we caught and everything like that. And I remember Bubba threw that overboard. So I don't know if he thought it was less weight or something like that. But you know, I, I just remember we were talking about that that today. But anyway, so we were going. And Danny shining the spotlight, and like I said, I hear those trees crash and everything like that. And that, that's when you see it run, and then it just jumps. And I remember Danny had was trying his best to follow it. You couldn't follow it because it, it, it jumped so fast. It jumped from one side of the bank to the other side. And it was probably, well, like I said, I didn't pay attention during the day about how far it was. And at night, I couldn't tell. But if I had to guess, probably 30, 40 yards. So it went there and it jumped on the other side, and then you would hear the same thing, like trees crash and everything like that, and then it would jump on the other side. And then it did that another time or two, and then it got quiet. The only thing you could hear, there wasn't no bullfrogs chirping. There wasn't, I mean, bullfrogs croaking, no tree frogs, nothing. You couldn't even hear anything. The only thing you could hear was us breathing. So we're going, and it stopped. And that probably happened, you know, it probably stopped for about 15, 20 seconds. Then all of a sudden, the same thing would go. You hear trees crashing, 
and then Danny would shine on it, and you could hit, you could see it dart through the woods. I was talking, well, Bubba was talking to Danny today. He said he saw coyotes running, either a coyote running with it, a big coyote, or or some other animal running with it. I didn't see that, but Danny told Bubba today that he did see that. So <clears throat> again, well, you know, so if the same thing happened. It, it 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 would stop, jump from one side of the bank to another. Trees crash, and then we're going another 25, 30 seconds, nothing. Then the same thing happened. It was almost like he was toying with it. It was almost like he knew at any second, if I wanted to kill these, to kill this, to kill them, I could. If I, at any second, if I wanted to just rip their bodies apart, I could do it. And, and he knew that, and it was like almost he was toying with us. So, like I said, the same pattern happened for about three minutes. And finally, finally, we get to where the Red River, the main inlet, opens up to Lake Texoma. And it wasn't until we was about 150, 200 yards, maybe a little bit more, outside of where that main river was that I eventually calmed down. We gathered our thoughts, and I wasn't scared so much. Um, so then we get back. We get back to the marina. Usually when we get back to the marina, you know, we, we hang out talk about the fish, clean the fish. This time we didn't do that. We we tied the boat up, hightailed it to the trailer, and we just, I remember, we, I just remember we all made, all three of me, Danny, and Bubba made some stout whiskeys, went out on the patio, looked at each other, and just, we, you know, we were really shooken up and just kind of talked about what the was that we saw and what just happened to us. And that's, that's the story. Wow, what a night. Yeah, anyone who had an experience like that, they'd have a hard time dealing with that. I don't care who you are. How far did you say you saw a jump from one bank to the bank on the other side? You know, Vic, I can't be for certain. I can't tell you. Because the thing is, I've crossed the Red River hundreds of times. If you're going over 35 from Texas to Oklahoma, or if you're on 377 or something like that, you're looking at the Red River, and it's longer than 30 or 40 yards it's a really big river unless it's in the summertime or something like that or we have a drought and i think what it may have happened i can't be for sure but i think we went on the main thing the main river and maybe we like cut off and got like on some kind of inlet or tributary or whatever it's called but i can't say for sure for certain but it has i mean the thing jumped at least 30 40 yards that's how far the banks were from each other that's an amazing jump but these things are amazing jumpers, so I guess it's hard to know what their limits are. How close were you to that dog man at your closest point? Well, we were just on the other side of the bank, which was, like I said, 30, 40 yards. But we had to have, I think once we saw it, or somehow Bubba, because we weren't tied up on the other side of the bank. He was just holding it. And I think with all the commotion, Danny trying to get the clips back on the battery terminal, trying to get the spotlight going and and us just looking at this thing on all fours, pacing back and forth. I think Bubba must have put his hands or or not grabbed on it no more. And I think we, without knowing it, I think we were drifting closer to this thing. So we were at our closest. I think we were probably 15 yards, 20 yards, I think, because uh, like I said, we were close enough that when Danny was shining his light on it, his, I just remember his ears were pointed and I could see like two or three, I couldn't see him good, but I could see like there was like hair coming off the top of his ears. And I could tell that his nose was black like a dog. And I mentioned this to you last time, and the bottom of his feet, I don't know what the exact word is, concave or something like that. But regular canines, you know how their feet are like, they don't go forward like humans do. They, Their kneecap, it like went backwards. And it was standing like that. We were close enough where I could see all that, and we were close enough where I could see where there wasn't a lot of hair on his chest. It, well, there, there was a little bit, but his hair wasn't his, uh, his stomach didn't have as much hair as the rest of his body did. So, I mean, uh, like I said, I think we were drifting closer to it once everything was going on and didn't know it, because for me to see all the glow, the yellow light of the eyes, the claws from his fingertips, we had to have been 15 yards from it. Wow. Yeah, that's way too close for comfort. Yeah. Yeah, I'd say it is. How far do you live from where that encounter happened? I actually live in Sanger. It's probably about a 45-minute drive. 
for more like Texel Mayas. Well, I guess in situations like this, it's best to have a little bit of distance between where you live and where that encounter happened, so that's a good thing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I'd say it is. How remote is the area where that encounter happened? Well, Lake Texoma isn't that remote. Like I was saying earlier, I mean, it's out there. It's up in there in Gordonville. Well, the area we are in Gordonville. I mean, there are places that's remote and everything like that. But like I was saying, Vic, I mean, it's it's a pretty family-friendly lake. I mean, all these marinas out there, you know, there's places where you can go. There's cabins. You know, they have marinas out there, people's boat slips. There's some marinas that have restaurants and everything like that. But once you get into where the Red River goes into it, there's really not any houses or anything like that. It's pretty remote. And a lot of that land out there surrounding Lake Texoma is owned by the Corps of Engineers. And they use it for hunting and stuff like that. And if it's owned by the Corps of Engineers, I don't know if you can, I guess you can put houses on it because some of the land that's owned by the Corps of Engineers, the marina's on. But to answer your question, it's pretty remote, but not remote like where people don't drive by or go by a lot, if that makes sense. Yeah, I think that does make sense. As you were checking jugs that night, did you see other fishermen, or did you seem to have the area to yourselves? Well, that Tuesday was July 4th, and it was that Saturday. So... Usually, I mean, if you go out there around 10, I think we left around 10, something like that. And we were combined from the time we was out there from the time we came back. It probably took us an hour and a half, hour, 45 minutes. But, I mean, there was other boats. I mean, you could see it was dark, but there was other boats going back and forth and stuff like that. And a lot of times on the weekends, there's these big boats or pontoon boats and stuff like that. What they'll do, they'll just beach up on some of these islands and have campfires and you know, just camp out all night and stuff like that. And we could see some of that in the distance, but going towards the Red River where we was, there was no place to do that. So there were some boats on there because obviously July 4th weekend, but not a lot. So it sounds like you had boats fairly close by, but none of them were close enough to know that you were having the experience that you were having. Oh, no, there wasn't a boat. I don't know what the closest boat was, but I mean, if we screamed bloody murder for someone to help us, no one would have heard us. Do you know if the water you were on at the time when you were getting away from the dog man was too deep for it to stand in? Well, like I was saying, I mean, like when people say this thing was 12 foot tall, I don't know how they know that unless they go back the next day and they see a point of reference. And I was so scared. I wasn't trying to see a point of reference, but like I said, it had to have been at least 10, 11, 12 foot. There's parts on that river, like where it really opens up, that's a lot deeper than that. To answer your question, I don't know. I mean, it was probably, it, it had, where we was at, it had to have been at least 15 foot, I would assume. Well, a lot of people think that dogmen can't swim. I don't know if it's because they haven't put any thought into it or what, but you do realize they can swim, don't you? I do now. Not a very comforting thought. I realize that. No, it's not. Do you think that dog man had been stalking you for some time before it threw that rock in the water, or do you think it threw the rock about the same time it realized you were there? Vic, I I have no clue. I mean, I think the whole thing with this whole deal, this whole experience, it was teasing us. It was mocking us. Like I was saying, if it wanted to kill us, it could have at any moment. It very well could have been just looking at us for a little bit while we was checking the jug lines. It could have got curious because we were shining, Danny was shining that spotlight. Because like I was saying to you earlier, we had that reflective tape on those limb lines, on those branches, so they would reflect back so we would know where the limb lines were. And we were shining it all through there. It could have seen that from a distance and watched us and figured out just trying to see what we was going to do. And then we could have got close to where he was eating or we could have got close to where his den was, where these things live or something like that. And just, I don't know. I, I, I don't know if it was watching us or if it, we just so happened to scare it or something like that. I don't know. To be honest with you, I couldn't answer it. The most important thing is you now realize that if that dog man wanted to kill all three of you, it definitely could have done that that night, but it obviously didn't want to do that. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it could have in seconds, too. We could have been dead in seconds. 
I think if I would have had a high powered rifle and a 45 pistol and we all had guns with us and everything like that, that thing coming at us with that speed that it had, I don't even think it would have affected it at all, to tell you the truth. I think you're right on that. Yeah, a lot of people who find out about dogmen, especially people who have encounters with them, seems like they want to get some kind of revenge and they start strapping on guns and they think that's some form of guaranteed protection against them, but it's not. Look at all the instances where people tried to shoot these things with pretty powerful weaponry and it didn't have the desired effect, so please don't fall into that trap and think that way. Yeah, I'm not. We were kind of talking about this when we had our conversation last week or whenever it was about I was wanting to go out and me and my brothers talk about going out and putting some trail cameras out and everything like that, trying to get it on film and everything like that. And with having not much knowledge on it, I guess you just think if it's during the day that it's going to be safer and everything like that. But what you were telling me that most encounters happen during the day versus at night. I'm glad you know that now. Yeah, as far as revenge and getting back at this thing, I mean, this thing, there's no revenge or or stopping it. Or This thing can't be defeated, at least by human weapons, I don't think. I, I, I think I'm just going to leave well enough alone. We all got out of there with our lives, and I just don't want to provoke it or even be anywhere near it again. Yeah, I'd say that's definitely the best way to handle this. From the point where you were able to finally see the lights of the marina to the point where you got onto the dock, were those the longest minutes of your life? Yeah, it seemed. I mean, that route we took, like I said, my brother and his wife, they've had that place probably three, four years now. And we've taken that route hundreds of times before and set jugs hundreds of times before and gone down that exact route that we always take. And obviously, we were in a smaller boat with a smaller engine, but... Yeah, it took a little bit longer this time. It seemed like it was, I don't know how long it took, maybe 20, 30 minutes, or maybe not even that long. But yeah, it seemed like it took a lot longer. Oh, I'd imagine it must have felt like it took forever. Have you been back to that place where you had that encounter since you had it? To the lake or to that exact encounter? To that exact spot where you saw the dog meet? No, no, absolutely not. I'll never go back to that place as long as I live. Uh, you, you could you could say, I don't care if it's daytime or at night, you could say, Buster, I'm going to give you $5 million. Let's just go up to that place and let's just walk around and, and see what happened. There, there's there's not, a, there's not a, a dollar amount in this world that would make me go back. I'm never going back there as long as I live. Oh, I don't blame you. You go through an experience like that, and yeah, that's only natural to respond that way. You said a couple of things that you observed that night that that dogman was doing that might be the answer to this question, so I'm kind of fuzzy on this. What behavior that you observed that dogman displaying that night was the most unnerving one for you? Well, it had to have been the sound of like the hissing sound that it made and the bones just cracking. It was like when it was on all fours, it was like it was kind of like, I don't know if you want to say like his natural state. Uh, that was more comfortable to him. And when he had to get up, just the hissing, that, that hissing, I don't know where that hissing sound came from. Like I said, it was like robotic or something. And the sound of, it's like he had to like readjust his legs and readjust his whole body and break bones just to stand up. Obviously, the whole thing just frightened me to death. But the one thing that when I lay up at night think about is, just that sound. I was, you know, I was actually in line at Walmart today buying some groceries and everything like that. And this guy behind me, you know, like when people get their knuckles and they like roll it on their palm and they crack four or five knuckles at the same time, the guy behind me did that. And I remember I just kind of looked back and jumped because the experience of the counter I had was still fresh in my mind. And for a second there, it kind of scared me. It's going to be some time before you're going to be able to reflect back on what happened that night and not have your pulse race, but you're going to get there. It's just going to take time. As your brother was trying to start the motor at the back of the boat there, did you ever turn to look back at him, or did you keep your eyes locked on the dog man the whole time? No. I had my eyes locked on the dog man. Me and Danny both did. He was shining the light on it. And as soon as Bubba put on the motor for the first time you heard the engine roll and that got us out of our trance and we kind of looked at it 
But as soon as we looked at him, I knew what he was doing, and it flashed through my mind. Going back earlier in the day when it took him all those times to start it and everything like that, and I just thought about that. And as soon as I thought about that, that's when I just looked back at it. I looked back at the dog, man, and that's when he pulled it the second time and got it started and started cruising us out of there. I see. You said in the pre-interview that for 15 seconds or so after you started heading away from that dog man, you didn't hear it coming after you. What do you think it was doing at that time? I don't know. I don't know if it was playing mind games with us and it wanted us to think for a brief moment that we were safe and it wanted us to maybe drop our composure or drop our guard and then just start going crazy like it was doing, knocking trees down and jumping to get us scared again or what. But I don't know. Or maybe it was just looking at us driving away. I mean, like I was saying, it was a 12, 13, 4, whatever it is, John Boat with a 20, 25 horsepower, Evan Rue Johnson. We weren't going that fast. I mean, with three grown men in it, you know, we were going along, but we weren't going that fast. And the way this thing moved, the way this thing jumped, it could have got us any second. So, the 15, 20 seconds or whatever it was that he didn't do anything. I don't know why he did that. Maybe he was just, like I said, just wanting us to think for a couple seconds that we were out of the clear. Did you ever consider the possibility that other dogmen might have been around when you were trying to get away from the one you saw? Well, not at the time. After I really started doing the research on them and stuff like that and really listening to a lot of other people's encounters. Because like I was saying, at first, when you see something like this, or at least I did, I don't know what other people's thoughts or feelings is on it, but as soon as I saw it for the first time, Vic, like I said, I thought it was something from hell. I thought it was a demon dog, werewolf, something. And as soon as I saw it, I'm like, this thing I'm seeing, I'm the only person that's ever seen something like this. No one's ever seen something like this. But then after I started listening to other people's encounters and their similarities were the same thing, you know, just freakishly fast speed, jumping high in the air, you know, with the way it looked like and everything like that. And like how we was talking the other day about there's encounters where dogmen have been on the side of the road eating food or drinking out of rivers or something like that. And that's kind of led me to think that this is something that, you know, is probably an animal that has probably evolved over time and and somehow managed to elude human beings but like i was telling you earlier bubba was talking to danny today and i didn't see it and bubba said he didn't see it either but danny said at one point when he was shining the light it wasn't on two legs but he said it was running on all four legs and it wasn't a coyote mountain lion or anything like that he said it was really big So, I mean, yeah, that's led me to think that maybe there was a couple of them out there looking at us. So Danny said he caught something in that beam that seemed to be with that dog man that wasn't quite as big as that one was, but it might have been another dog man? Well, I can't say for sure that it was another dog man. Bubba told me that he asked Danny, was it something that looked like it was like what we saw? And he was like, man, I don't know. I only saw it for a couple seconds. While we were going back, it would have been on the right side, the side that we saw, the main one. He said it was like it was running with it. But we only saw one jump across the bank. We only saw one. We didn't see two. And I only saw one. Bubba only saw one. Danny was the only one that he thought he saw a second one running with it on all fours. I see. Well, it just might have been another dog, man. They do run in numbers sometimes. Yeah, it's possible, I guess. Did you guys argue at any point about what it was you had seen that night? Well, it really wasn't arguing or anything like that. It was mainly just talking back and forth, just throwing our ideals or opinions out there of what we thought it was. The first time it happened, we all thought it was something from hell. We thought it was some kind of demon. I mean, the ideal of these things roaming through the woods. Me and Bubba's been in the woods our whole life. Danny has too. In our head, stuff like that just wasn't real and it didn't exist. And to see that, it was, like I said, something from hell. So we talked about it and we tossed around the possibility, but we were like, it's impossible that it could be an animal that's part of the animal species. 
I see. Have all three of you given up on the idea of heading back into the woods, or are all of you still open to doing things like that? Well, like we were talking about earlier, me and Bubba, we initially thought about putting cameras out there and trying to get it on film and everything like that. But after you said that more of these things are seen during the day, I'm not going back to that exact spot during the day. As far as going back to the woods some other place during hunting season and stuff like that, I mean, I like to say, Vic, that I wouldn't be scared. And when I'm walking through the woods at 530 in the morning by myself to the deer blind, the image of that thing isn't going to be in my head and I won't be scared. But I don't know. I can't answer that question until... I guess it happens. I like to think I could, but I don't know. Oh, I can appreciate that. You'll never know until you know, until you have a chance to try and head back into the woods and see how you respond. There's a recurring nightmare about that dogman that's been tormenting you. Please tell us about it. All right. So, yeah, this nightmare that I've been having, it happened, like I said, that encounter we had was Saturday, and it's happened every single night. It happened last night. It happened every single night. I don't know how long I'm going to keep having it. It's an awful dream, an awful nightmare. But where my brother's lake house is, you can walk out, and there's like this wooden patio, and you walk out to the left, and you look down, and there's this boat dock. Well, across the boat dock, I don't know, maybe 150, 200 yards is where the wood line is and everything like that. And Usually when I go over there, there's only two rooms, and they have kids and everything like that. Both the rooms are usually taken and everything like that. So usually there's this big sectional couch that I just sleep on. So in my dream, I'm at his lake house. I'm sleeping on the sectional couch, and I just hear my brother just screaming an ungodly scream, like like he's scared to death, like just something's after him. And so in my dream, I get up and it's like there's a 200, 300 pound book bag, like on my, you know how dreams are like when you're trying to get away from something or something like that and you can't move and like you're in quicksand or like there's big things on your back. So I hear him scream and I know my brother's in trouble and I know it's probably the dog man that's after him. And he's probably out there in my dream. I just know he's out there in those woods. And I know there's that John boat right by the, for some reason, that John boat in my dream is always by that boat dock. And I'm just thinking, all right, of that boat ramp, rather. If I can just get to that boat ramp, I can go over there and help him because I know he needs my help. That thing is just killing him. So in my dream, I'm going down there and it takes forever for me to get down there. And I get in the boat and that in my dream, I just remember I have, there's no paddle. So I just use my hands to paddle. And then you know how dreams are. They can just like go back and forth, all crazy stuff. So the next thing in my dream, it's like <clears throat> rain and thundering storm and it's lightning and rain just crashing down, beat my face. And by this time I can move faster. I don't have that weight on me. So I jump out the boat and I'm running through the woods and I don't hear him screaming no more. And I'm just yelling, Bubba, Bubba, but I can't hear him. And I finally hear like bones crack and everything like that. And I'm thinking, okay, it's probably this thing standing up, but I get closer and I see like my brother laying down in the woods and his face is just look, his eyes are looking at me, but I know he's dead and I'm just looking at him. And then I look over to the left and I see this thing just like the dog man just bent over him and he has his, you know how like a like when you're eating like a piece of chicken or a drumstick, how you would eat like that piece of chicken? So there's the dog, man, he has like my brother's leg. It's ripped off his body, and I can just see his teeth, and it's full of blood, and blood's dripping down his chin, and he's just like ripping skin off, just eating my brother's leg. Wow, that's a horrible nightmare, Buster. Goodness gracious. That's rough. Your brother's wife could tell he was having trouble dealing with something he had experienced. Please fill us in on how that went down. Well, I didn't tell nobody up until that Saturday when I told Todd and Mark about what happened after we apologized, you know, for making fun of him about his Bigfoot experience. So I just kept it to myself the whole time. I mean, it's really not a story you can tell people, but Bubba's wife, she didn't want me to say her name. So about Wednesday or Thursday of that week, 
all through the week, she would go up to him and say, hey, I know something's wrong. When y'all came back Saturday night, that next morning we woke up, I could just tell something wasn't right. Did you and Buster get into a fight? Did Danny and Buster get into an argument or, or something like that or whatever? What happened? And the whole week he was like, oh, no, it's, it's no big deal. I, you know, there's a lot of stuff, you know, with work I got going on and everything like that. And finally, it was, I don't know what day it was, Wednesday or Thursday. He just said later in the week, she finally just cornered him and said, listen, something's not right. I know something happened while y'all were setting jugs and limb lines. You got to tell me what happened. And that's when, you know, he finally, he said, he, you know, he kind of broke down and, you know, teared up a little bit and explained to her what happened. How did she respond when Bubba told her about what had happened? You know, he's not one to go around and tell jokes and make stories up and everything like that, especially with his wife. And that's the one question I asked him. I'm like, so as soon as you told her, I mean, is it something she believed or did she kind of laugh at you or what? And he said, no, he said, he told her, listen, what I'm about to tell you is 100% true. This happened to me. You're my wife. We've been married. I don't know how long I've been married, 15, 20 years, something like that. We've been married all this time, been together this long. And he said that as soon as he got done telling her the story, she just looked him in the eye, shook her head and said, my God. I mean, really, what can you say? I mean, obviously, there was lots of questions and everything like that afterwards. And he said he answered her the best he could. But that's about the only thing you can say is, my God. Yeah, I'd say you're right. And I'm glad that he had that talk with her. Now that Bubba was able to get that experience off his chest, is he handling it better than you and Danny? Well, I think me and Bubba's handling it a little bit better. Like I said, I sent him a link to your webpage, and I said, listen, you got to listen to this guy. This is what he does. He has all these people that he's interviewed. These people tell their encounters and everything like that. And I said, the same thing we saw, we're not the only people that saw it. I mean, the encounter that Vic has on his show, there's so many similarities. I'm like, it's going to do you a lot better to listen to this. I mean, just take an hour or two or whatever in the afternoon or an hour at lunch and just listen to some of these stories. It's going to make you feel a lot better about listening to these stories or encounters that people had. They're seeing the same thing we saw. And I think after me and Bubba listened to a couple of other people's stories or encounters, we came to the realization that, you know what, this probably isn't something from hell. It's probably not a demon. This probably is a regular animal. So I think we're taking it a little bit better than Danny. I think our fear has turned to curiosity. I've tried to call Danny a couple times during the week. I really can't get a hold of him. I got a hold of him the other day. My brother, he kind of works with him a little bit on jobs, so he talks to him a little bit more. But I think he's taken a little bit better than Danny is. It seems like when Bubba tried to talk to him about what's going on and everything like that, he just kind of walks away. He's like, man, I, I don't want to talk about it. I got stuff to do. We need to go to work and stuff like that. I think he thinks if he doesn't talk about it, he doesn't have to relive it. Well, I can understand him feeling that way, but there's only one way he's going to get better and be able to deal with it in a more effective way, and that's exposure. Do you know if Danny has confided in anyone the way Bubba has? I don't know. I haven't asked Bubba if Danny has told his wife or anything like that or if he's told anybody. I don't know. Uh, I know Danny was there when me and Bubba was apologizing to Todd. I know he was there and Danny just kind of walked away and everything like that, like he didn't want anything to do with it. But as far as telling his wife or any one of his kids or Anyone in his family, I don't know. I haven't talked to him. Like I said, I've tried to call him a couple times and to talk about it and, and everything like that. I just can't get a hold of him. So I, I don't know. I, I don't think he has, to my knowledge. Yeah, sounds like he probably hasn't. You told us about Todd at the start of the show. He lives in the area where you had your encounter. Has he seen anything like a dog man in that area? Well, Todd hasn't seen anything like that. All right, so here's the deal on that. Like I was telling you earlier, me and Bubba, when Todd told us about his Bigfoot encounter when he was a kid, he just said a kid, I don't know how old he was, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, something like that. I remember he was being serious with us and everything like that. And he was like, man, guys, I'm telling you, 
I think he said it was in West Texas. I don't know. But he was like, this thing really happened. These things are out there. They're real. And I remember we just, like I said, just went out of our way, which I really regret now. If I could do it over again, I would. But went out of our way to make them seem real dumb. And the whole week I was thinking about that, and I felt really bad. And I was talking to Bubba about that, too. So later that next week, that Saturday, we was discussing it. We're like, we probably really need to give Todd an apology because he confided in us. I mean, just think if if we confided in him about what we saw and we knew how terrified and petrified we were and the experience that we went through, if we confided in him and what we did to him, if he did to us, I mean, we would feel we're bad. So we apologized to him and we were telling him the story. And it's like when we were telling him the story, it's like he wasn't laughing or anything like that. I remember he was sitting down and he got up and he started walking around, getting real fidgety and stuff like that. And it's like while we was telling him, I just kept remembering it's like he wanted to tell us something. Like he just wanted our story to hurry up and be over with so he could tell us something. So this is what he told me. When he was a kid, he's been at Lake Texoma his whole life. He's probably in his 50s or something like that. But when he was a kid, him and his family had a cabin. I don't know exactly where, but somewhere obviously on Lake Texoma. Well, a little historical fact about Lake Texoma is during World War II, and I didn't know this. Actually, I had to look it up, and it's true. During World War II, they would bring Nazi soldiers over there. There was a POW camp up there in Grayson County. And what they would do, there was, you know, like I said, camps out there, and they had these Nazi prisoners, and they made them help build the lake. They would, like, cut down trees and, I don't know, like, dig or whatever they did. You know, they just made them work. So his story goes that, They had a small cabin, uh, one-bedroom cabin, and there was a couple kids. His mom and dad, they got the bedroom, obviously, and the kids, they would, at night when it got late, his mom would make them a pallet out on the living room floor of the cabin. They would lay down and everything like that, go to sleep. Well, at night, the parents would stay up, play dominoes, cards, or something like that. So this is how he told me. He said he woke up one night. It was hot. It was in the summer, obviously. He said they did have a small swamp cooler, but it was broken or something like that. So they had the windows up, and he said it was real hot, and he couldn't go to sleep. He said, remember, he kept kicking the covers off of him. He was sweating and everything like that. He said he didn't know what time it was. It was probably 1130 or midnight or something like that. It wasn't too late because his parents were still up. Well, anyway, there was a guy that lived across the field, and this guy lived there in Gordonville his whole life. And he was a kid at the time. And Todd had knew that there was a POW camp and everything like that. And he had heard stories about, I don't know the guy's name. It was Mr. Something. I I can't remember. I should have wrote it down. But he had told me stories about when he was a kid, that guy would go over there and talk to like the uh, soldiers from the American side and stuff like that. And he would see the German soldiers working and like cutting trees down and stuff like that. So this guy that lived across, the field creek or whatever where Todd's parents cabin was he was over there playing cards with him one night and Todd said like I said he was hot and everything like that he said he woke up kicking the covers off and everything like that and he said he didn't get up he would just listen to his parents and that guy talk and he said he remembered that guy was telling him a story about when he was a kid that there was something going on in the woods and what this guy described as like a 12 foot he said monster or booger or something like that. I think back then in the South, they called them boogers or something like that. But he said something about all he could remember was there was a couple German soldiers that went missing. A couple of them was like ripped out of their tents that night. But I mean, there wasn't how it is now about the news media and stuff like that. And no one really cared because, I mean, if you think about it, it was during World War II. But yeah, so Todd said he didn't know if it was just one soldier or whatever that got ripped out of a tent or if it was two or something like that. But I kept pressing him on it because, like I said, the curiosity of this thing is killing me and I want to know what's going on. And I kept pressing him for questions. He's like, Buster, I can't remember. Man, this was years ago. He was like, all I remember, I just woke up and I heard this story about some kind of monster, some kind of, in the South, they call them boogers. It ripped. There may have been one, it may have been two Nazi soldiers out of a tent, and later that night, they shot at him or something like that. But like I was saying, 
you know, back then was different days, the news media and stuff like that. Things wasn't really covered like it was today. And it was Nazi soldiers, so probably no one really cared about it. If that's a true story, it makes you wonder if it might have been a Sasquatch instead of a dogman, considering the fact that Sasquatch are called boogers in the South, not dogmen. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I remember my grandparents, they would always say booger and stuff like that. I don't know if that was just a general word that they said for all types of monsters or something like that. But I remember talking to them and, you know, like I said, I'm real curious and everything like that. I told him to get in touch with his dad because he don't remember the guy's name or anything like that. I told Todd to talk to his dad and see if he still knows where this guy lives or something like that where I can go by and and talk to him because I'm just, I want to hear the whole story. I hope you are able to find out more about what really happened down there. Well, Buster, it's about time for us to get out of here. Before we do, do you have any closing comments you'd like to share? I just want to tell you, Vic, I've told you a couple times when we had that conversation the other day, and when this encounter happened to us and we saw this thing, this dog man, this whatever we want to call it, we thought we were by ourselves. We thought we were the only people that seen something like this. And luckily, I came across your website, and I reached out to you. And you were gracious enough to get back with me and listen to my story. And it's really helped me out. And I just want to say you do a good thing of what you're doing about talking to these people. And I just want to thank you for that. Oh, you know, you're welcome. This is what I do. That's why I do what I do. So it's always so good to hear that it's actually helping people. That's all the reward I need. But having said that, I do hope you have a great night. And like I told you before, thank you so much for coming on the show tonight and sharing that experience with us. I really do appreciate it. Thanks for having me, Vic. Have a great night. Bye. Bye. If you've had a dogman encounter of your own and would like to speak with me, whether in private or on the show, please go to dogmanencounters.com and submit a report. I'd love to hear from you.